Hi friends, uh, I am Dr. Naufal from Conceptual Orthopedics and it's my pleasure to welcome Professor S. M. Tuli today with us to discuss a few questions on spine. So this will be an OSCE session. So we'll be uh, showing you common X-rays and MRIs of patients who have complaints of spine issues. And we'll be discussing few questions with Sir. So Sir has an immense experience in the field of orthopedics as well as spine surgery. So today we shall hear from him. So coming to the first question. Good morning, sir. Morning. So this is a X-ray of the spine. A lateral view is shown, sir. And the first question would be, can you explain what is shown in this image? Mm. The lateral view shows you that uh, lumbar fourth vertebral body has slipped forward over the lumbar five vertebral body. At, lumbar f at the lumbosacral junction, sometimes it may be difficult to count them with confidence because many patients would show a transitional lumbosacral junction. So whenever you say, sir, this looks like L4 sliding over L5, one can say the counting can be, can be inadequate. And generally, when there is an anterior slip, it's called antrolisthesis. It is expressed in, in general, it is expressed in percentages. Is it 10%, 20%? In this particular patient, it looks like roughly 35% of anterior slip over, anterior slip of L4 vertebral body over L5 vertebral body. Now, sometimes the question is, uh, why did it slip? Probably there was a weakness in the posterior elements of L4 we consider this is L4, the posterior elements would mean the interpedicular facets, uh, what is called the bone between the superior and inferior articular facet. Was that bone weak? Was it congenitally made poor? Uh, did it undergo fracture due to injury or insufficient calcium in it? Uh, did it undergo degeneration? Rarely it can be infected and get damaged, thus permitting the L4 vertebral body to slip in front of the L5 vertebral body. Rarely you can get what is called retrolisthesis. Again, probably the cause is the same, but retrolisthesis, the vertebral body would shift backwards over the vertebral body down below. That's relatively rare condition. Most of the retrolysthesis are caused by degenerative disease, but many of the entrolysthesis are due to a defect in the pars interarticularis. Sir, uh, this is an image which shows a flexion as well as, an, well as an extension view of the spine. So I think this is done to assess the instability, the dynamic instability of the spine. So do you get it done commonly in your patients, sir? I think the wisdom lies that we should do this test. In complete flexion as well as in complete extension, even in this particular patient, you can see that the listhesis looks less displaced when you see it in extension, which means the area of listhesis is not fully stabilized. With the passage of time, many of these listhesis get stabilized. But if a listhesis does not get stabilized and the listhesis is advanced and if the patient has neural signs, then one may start thinking of decompression of the dural tube and fusion of the vertebral bodies so that it does not displace further. The swearest form of listhesis, the proximal vertebra slips in front of the distal vertebra. That is called spondyloptosis. But that happened generally L5 on S1. The L5 slips so much and comes to lie in front of the S1 vertebral border and that is what is called spondyloptosis. 
And if you carefully look at these patients with spondyloptosis, you will find two things. One, upper border of the sacrum is convex. It is not a straight line. It is a convex. And lumbar five vertebral body is trapezoidal. Its shape is different than the other bodies. It is trapezoidal. So if you find a trapezoidal vertebral body, L5, and convex upper border of the sacrum, you can find that the chances of slipping are much more than the patients in whom the vertebra has a normal shape. Sir, do you prevent doing this in acute traumatic conditions, the flexion extension view? Or is it safe to do in an acute scenario also, sir? I think in an acute trauma, it doesn't seem wise to perform a flexion extension x-ray in an acute case. Okay. Sir, a normal lateral x-ray, what all do you look for? We must see the vertebral bodies, intervertebral disc space, the behavior of the paradiscal borders, the height of the disc space, and then we go to the posterior elements. Are they in alignment? Do they show any hypertrophied osteophytosis? Look at the spinous processes. Are they visible? Are the two vertebral bodies fused? That is called a bone block formation. If it is a congenital bone block formation, generally posterior elements will also be showing fused spinous processes. But in an acquired bone block formation, generally you will be able to find two spinous processes, two pedicles. Whereas in a congenital block formation, posterior elements may also be fused. And if it is not a no, if it is a non-traumatic case, non acute traumatic case, it is wise to do an X-ray inflection and extension, which can show you the stability of the vertebral column. Thank you, sir. Coming to the next question. So this was the explanation of the first question. So this is a normal MRI of the spine. We have marked five particular points on the MRI. So can you just uh, tell us what exactly it shows? What is A, B, C, D, and E? The moment you see this section, <coughs> you are sure that this is a section distal to L1 vertebral body. You don't see the cord here. All that you are seeing is a cross-sectioned cauda equina. You are seeing the nerve roots floating in the CSF. Then you are also seeing that these nerve roots are contained in a in a in an envelope created by the dural tube. Then we go outside the dural spool tube. There is enough space around the dural tube. And outside the dural tube, in front there is a vertebral body. On the sides there are pedicles and at the back there are spinous processes, uh, the lamina and the spinous process. Keep it in mind that the under surface of the or the ventral surface of the lamina is covered by ligamentum flavum which may sometimes get hypertrophied. Uh, this can happen particularly in lumbar spine rarely in lumbar spine but more frequent in cervical spine and one can see the roots for the nerves between the posterior elements and the anterior elements on the lateral in the middle you find a space that is a space where the nerve root from a particular level will try to go out in front of the distal transverse process transverse process of the distal vertebra and enter into the swas muscle. You can see beautifully, look at the swas muscle, vertebral body, it is covered with the swas muscle on the left and right side. And we also look at the two swas muscles so that we all the time keep on comparing left to the right. 
and one can see a facet joint at the back, which is a synovial joint. You can see the 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 whitish color which is visible to you means there is a fluid in it. And do remember that small we call mnemonics T to water white. T therefore T1 is water black. Anything which changes the color in MRI is essentially the water content. Here you are seeing the water content within the dural tube. You are seeing the water content in the facet joints and this content will change the color if you see T1. And also remember that fat, wherever there is a fat, fat will look white both in T1 as well as in T2. I think these simple things if we can remember it is so easy to interpret reasonably well the MRIs. So we also have a stir image in which the fat is suppressed. So in case you want to identify much more without the fat, you can get a stir image done. Yep, yep. So A was the traversing nerve roots which I had shown already, the facet joints, you have seen the ligamentum flavum, the spinous process towards the end and the lamina. The next question is an MRI film, a sagittal view shown and there is something happening over here. So can you just uh, give us some insight onto the MRI sir? The lateral view of the MRI shows, you can see whitish discs, which means the MRI belongs to a relatively young man. And if you start counting, what, what is the count? Five, four, three, L1, probably L1 or L2 vertebral body, one can count it from below upwards, that vertebral body is crushed. The vertical height is reduced, but when we think of the anteroposterior diameter, probably it is increased. Some part of the vertebral body has been pushed behind and if there is a history of injury, this is post-traumatic burst fracture of the vertebral body. And if you carefully look at the posterior elements, you know, in just almost opposite to this compressed vertebral body, the posterior elements also show as if they are traumatized, their image looks different than the image of the posterior elements distal to it and proximal to it. It looks like that there is a fluid collected there. You can see the fluid behind. See, there is a fluid collected, which means probably there is a post-traumatic fluid collection, edema. Looks like a relatively recent injury causing a compressed vertebral body. That's what it is. However, you can also see the change of color of the intervertebral disc at L5-S1 area. Around the age of 30, 35, our discs start losing the fluid in it and the loss of fluid as a rule starts from the bottom. The first one which undergoes dehydration is L5-S1. As a rule, you see there is nothing like mathematics in medicine, but as a rule the first disc which becomes dehydrated is L5-S1 or L4-L5. Upper discs take a little longer time to get dehydrated. The moment a disc is dehydrated, they become blackish in color both in T1 as well as in T2 radius. Now this looks like a fresh fracture of the vertebra with some damage to the posterior elements making the vertebral column unstable. And this is how we have to take care. Uh, these, these cases must need rest till the healing starts around th four weeks or five weeks time. So you want to take any additional uh, image of the MRI and why sir? I would certainly like to take a axial cut so that I know how much is the encroachment on the dural tube, 
how much the space left behind for the neural elements. It, al it will also give us the idea about the damage to the posterior elements. The students also should know about the Asia grading, which can be a probable question in your OSCE. So that is the Asia grading. You can go through it once. So the fourth question, 